about 1979, most people felt that black-footed ferrets were extinct. No one had reported seeing any, any black-footed ferrets alive. There was no evidence that they still existed. And it wasn't until Shep, a famous ranch dog owned by the Hogg family from Atitsi, Wyoming, rediscovered the black-footed ferret, turning the conservation world upside down. The family was sitting down eating breakfast. In the morning of September 26, 1981. My mom was certain that Shep, the famous dog, had gotten into a porcupine fight. And so she sent my dad out here to check. Well, when I stepped out there and looked, there was this ferret laying on the, I didn't know it was a ferret, but it was laying there on the ground. And I looked at it pretty soon. Well I, well, I picked it up and brought it in and laid it, laid it down, <laughs> showed it to Lucille and the kids, and said, look what the dog brought in. And they, they were like me. They didn't know what it was either. After I got to eat, Lucille says, well, let's take that that down and have it mounted. So we went to town, parked in front of the post office, got our mail, and walked across the street to the uh, LaFrenchie's taxidermy shop. I had it in a gunny sack and dumped it out on the floor. He laid it out, and there was a very odd look on Larry LaFrenchie's face, and he actually took it to the back and he made a phone call and then he came out and he looked at my parents. Oh, he said, oh my God, you got a, a black-footed ferret there. Which is an endangered species um, on your hands and we're gonna have to confiscate it. And I said, black-footed ferret, what's that? <laughs> and then he told a story about it. Anyway, they took, he just grabbed it up and I never had anything to say about whether I was gonna get it back or not. This would have been in 1981, and we were conducting pipeline surveys. There was a big gas pipeline that was between Rock Springs and Rawlins. And we, the Fish and Wildlife Service, had been contracted to go out and look for ferrets along this pipeline corridor. So we were just about finishing that, that project up when uh, we made our, our typical report in to the, the supervisor, and then he informed us at that time that there had been a ferret discovered in the Matitsi area, thought to have been killed by a, a dog. My supervisor, who was Max Schroeder, Max said that uh, he wanted Steve Martin, who was the other biologist, and myself to take a trailer and go to Matitsi and, and look around. And our instructions at that point were to meet the landowners in the area, look around, find out where the prairie dog towns were, and if we were successful in finding a live black-footed ferret, to go ahead and trap it and make arrangements to fit it with the radio collar. The day before we discovered the first ferret, we had looked around in this prairie dog town and we had found a couple of places that we thought maybe ferrets were there. We set a couple of traps in a, different, a couple of different locations and we were actually coming back the next morning to check that area. And it was about 6.20 in the morning when the ferret ran from my side of the pickup truck, I was on the passenger side, across the two-track road and went down the hole. It's difficult to describe the feeling because we had gone four field seasons without ever seeing anything live. So to see one run across the road in front of us early in the morning with a spotlight, it was almost surreal. It took us a, a few seconds just to, to verify what we did see, you know, in fact, was what we thought it was. Steve and I talked back and forth in the truck, you know, what did you see, what did I see? I asked him what he saw. We put two and two together, we jumped out of the truck, and by the time we got to the hole, the ferret started to come back up again, so we were able to see a, clearly then a good picture of his face, the black mask the Mickey Mouse kind of ears and the little spots over the eyes. We saw everything that we knew we needed to see. We immediately set one of these traps, and this is the old, one of the old original uh, black-footed ferret traps. The idea is that you stick this end into the prairie dog town, or into the hole, the prairie dog burrow, 
And when the animal comes into the trap, he walks up, steps on this little treadle, and if it's all working correctly, traps, the door shuts behind him. And then you've got him. So I sat there all day with a tarp wrapped around me in a lawn chair, waiting for this ferret to be captured. In the meantime, Steve, he went into town, into Matitsi, met with veterinarian Bill Gould. That evening, when he finally come back up, and with a spotlight, I shined on the trap, and I saw that uh, I could see eye shine, and I knew as soon as I saw the eye shine that he had trapped himself and that we had, we had captured him. We brought him immediately then into the veterinary's office, and we anesthetized the animal and collected some museum measurements, if you will. 752. Foot length, overall length, tail length. Pulled a few ticks that we would use for later analysis. Looked at the teeth. The teeth were of a very young animal, which was a good sign. After the vet put the uh, radio collar on, we put the animal back into the nest box that we had built. The next morning, before we took him back out to where we located him, I opened the nest box just enough to see if he was still okay, and he barked at me then, and I knew that he was in good shape. We just took him right back to the spot, and then we released him. The nice thing about having that radio collar on was that we were able to track him. So by following the animal, we were able to find more ferrets. That was the intent all along, and it worked out very well. Even though there had been studies in South Dakota extending from about 1964 through 74, uh, there had been no use of telemetry, so uh, the animal being mostly nocturnal was still behaviorally fairly poorly understood. The techniques that we were using were pretty antiquated compared to what equipment that we have today. But we used handheld antennas, or what we called Yagi's. We went from that to antennas mounted on trucks where we could drive around and find ferrets using the truck mounted antennas to where we actually had trailers, house trailers, with a large antenna built into them so that we could sit up on a ridge and we could triangulate. We were tracking animals 24-7, four crews actually, of two people each. My mother called all of the biologists who were here ferret hunters, and she didn't mean it in the sense of hunting to kill, you know, she meant they're hunting to try to find them. You're, you're just scanning out there in the dark, and all of a sudden you pick up this signal and you know where the animal is, you know it's active, it's alive, it's moving, it's hunting, and it's one of the rarest mammals, if not the rarest mammal, uh, in North America. It was a thrill. Well, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 ferrets that we had located for an animal that was thought to be extinct. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty awesome. So you can imagine all the excitement, um, the fear, the consternation of this animal that was thought to be extinct suddenly being found. What do we do? Do we let the animal survive in the wild? Do we bring it into captivity? Since there was nobody else in charge and it was a Wyoming and a Wyoming animal, the state's attitude has always been that the wildlife belongs to the state and so we developed the Blackfooted Ferret Advisory Team, which had representatives from the university and the Forest Service and the BLM and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And the Pitchfork Ranch under Jack Turnell's management. Those people were charged with making the final decisions on what was going to go on out there in the field. There's considerable disagreement on what kind of management the ferret should receive at that time. About half of the people working on ferrets thought they should leave them alone, and the other half of the people working on it, on the species, felt that they should be brought into captivity. So I did quite mostly planning stuff and tried to come to a consensus. From the beginning, we got pressure to take them all into captivity for captive breeding. 
since they had survived there apparently for a considerable amount of time, it didn't look to us like it was any big rush. Nobody knew how to captive breed them. There still was some thought that ferrets might be found elsewhere, so we were trying to improve search techniques, find out more about activity periods of the animals, and also just about uh, factors in the life history of the animal that might be important for its conservation. I had uh, almost uh, six months to work on the planning to talk to the various people that had a stake in the ferrets and, and really the experts in ferrets and small population biology. And I was focused on getting a consensus of what the decision would be before we had to make the decision. As time progressed, we started to see the, the, the folks in the field start to see the numbers of ferrets declining and the number of prairie dogs. We were finding sick and dying prairie dogs. And then things got fairly urgent. We found some carcasses of black-footed ferrets and it was determined that both canine distemper and sylvatic plague were working through these prairie dog towns. The numbers continued to drop by 1985 when diseases struck that colony. We were forced from thinking about strategies that might have been a more progressive type of thing where we would take small numbers of animals uh, and translocate or put them into a captive breeding program into an emergency effort. They went out and tried to capture as many black-footed ferrets as we could and at that time they were only able to capture 18. You really didn't have time to think about whether you were making a right or wrong decision. We decided to keep them in Wyoming, built the captive breeding facility. Tom Thorne, the late Tom Thorne, was in charge of the captive breeding program. Pretty comfortable in there. 